O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Grant us in our hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even in suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. And we hear the uh, word of the Lord first spoken to his prophet almost 800 years before Jesus. Amos comes to a divided kingdom in the northern part of Israel. Uh, Samaria has turned against the Lord, and Amos comes to call them to repentance. The Old Testament lesson is from the seventh chapter of Amos, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord stood by a straight wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, Then the Lord said, See, I will put a plumb line among the people Israel to show how crooked they are. I will not let the other way any I will not look the other way any longer. The places where Isaac's descendants worship will be destroyed. Israel's holy places will be turned into ruins. And I will attack King Jeroboam's family with a sword. Amaziah, a priest at Bethel, sent this message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is making evil plans against you with the people of Israel. He has been speaking so much that this land can't hold all his words. This is what Amos has said. Jeroboam will die by the sword. And the people of Israel will be taken as captives out of their own country. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Seer, go back right now to Judah. Do your prophesying and earn your living there. But don't prophesy anymore here at Bethel. This is the king's holy place, and it is the nation's temple. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I do not take my living as a prophet. Nor am I a member of a group of prophets. I make my living as a shepherd. And I take care of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me away from tending the flocks. And said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Last week we finished our reading in, um, go ahead and take finished our reading in Paul's letter to the Church of Corinth, and today we're beginning an eight-week series of readings in uh, Paul's letter to the Church of Ephesus. Um, Paul, encouraging this congregation, had been part of the founding of, with an uh, amazing blessing here in this, in this first chapter. Lesson is Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ, Christ God, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer. Before the creation of the world, he chose us through Christ to be holy and perfect in his presence. Because of his love, he had already decided to adopt us through Jesus Christ. He freely chose to do this so that the kindness he had given us in his dear Son would be. Praise and give him glory. Through the blood of his Son, we are set free from our sins. God forgives our failures because of his overflowing kindness. He poured out his kindness by giving us every kind of wisdom and insight when he revealed the mystery of his plan to us. He had decided to do this through Christ. He planned to bring all of history to its goals in Christ. Then Christ would be the head of everything in heaven and on earth. God also decided ahead of time to choose us through Christ according to his plan, which makes everything work the way he intends. He planned all of this so that we who had already focused our hope on Christ would praise him and give him glory. You heard and believed the message of truth, the good news that he has saved you. Amen. Holy Spirit is the guarantee that we will receive our inheritance. We have this guarantee until we are set free to belong to Him. God receives 
And it goes on and on and on. Somebody counted 30 different clauses, 30 thoughts, at least, in this single sentence from John. I mean, I know we have a short attention span, thanks to television and TikTok nowadays, but it's amazing that people can hold on to a thought like this. But what they did is, is they were able to do that because there were patterns in the thing. So the reason I put this whole page up there is I want you to know what's it all about. He gives it away in the first sentence. Praise. We praise God because we see, dear Ephesians, people of Concordia, Sarasota, how God has so blessed us. So it's a story of praise, and Paul actually repeats that sentence, that word, one, two, three times. In case you didn't get it, he says, praise and give glory. Praise, give glory. Give God praise and glory for what he's done for you. When you hear about three parts in something, especially here at church, what else does that make you think of? <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And sure enough, there it is. Praise God the Father. Part two, praise God his Son. Part three, praise give glory to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of what they've done for you. So I put it in blue here. Praise God. What did he do? The creator of heaven and earth. He chose us. Praise the Son. The Redeemer who by his blood came and acted in history according to God's great plan. And then praise the Holy Spirit, the one who sealed us, who gave us that faith imprint so that we know that forever we belong to God. Praise, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, the one who makes us holy, giving us faith. All of this beautiful stuff in a single sentence. And this trinity actually goes on. It's like this actually, if you think about it, is out of time before creation. God already had an idea, a plan. And then in history, Jesus came and made that come true. And then at the end, it gets really personal. You, individually, were sealed for this great future that is still to come. Past, present, and future. Father, Son, and Spirit. All of Creator working through all of creation so that you are His. In short, praise God! <laughs> the three in one always has, now does, forever will bless us. So almost a year ago, Ellen and I were in Bavaria, and we were trying to do some uh, tracking down of her family history, and heard stories from her grandfather about where he grew up in a little town there, and we actually found that place. It was a really cool little church, like almost in a moat at the uh, center of this old little village. And I went into the church, and I looked left, and, and right there on the wall was this thing in the narthex of the church. And it's kind of common artwork all over Bavaria, which uh, I just finally had to deal with, because I kept seeing this image. And it gave me different feelings. Uh, some of it I really liked, and some of it I really didn't. I mean, I very clearly see there, there's God the Father with the whole world in his hands and the Trinity behind him that suggests it's more than, you can pick, than we can picture there, but there's a great mystery there. But we know that, that God is the Father overall. We know that he sent Jesus, there he is with his cross, to come to our rescue. And then, you know, the Spirit time and again, from uh, Genesis 1 all the way to Jesus' baptism, uh, falling uh, like with the fire and Pentecost, we always see the Holy Spirit coming down gently and yet gloriously um, like a dove. So it's a, it's a way for us to picture in our minds this three-in-one God and his great love for us. But for heaven's sakes, it's not like somebody can go up to heaven and take a picture like this, right? <laughs> so when the Muslims look at a picture like this, they say, aha, we caught you. Because you say one God, but look at what you show us. You show us, oh, by the way, who is this? That's Mary, receiving the Spirit and the love of the Trinity. But the Muslims look at something like this and say, aha, you say, you say one God, but we know you've got three. Look at how you picture it. You've got God the Father, and you've got the Mother of God, and you've got Jesus. That's your Trinity. <laughs> so the Muslims don't even understand what the Trinity is supposed to be. But they say, three gods, right? That's not right. <laughs> I guess it's something to me, because um, I did not grow up with artwork like this, and going, well, you know, I, I love these pictures of the Trinity, but what's this big deal about Mary there? <laughs> and actually, that's kind of what Paul is talking about here today, though he doesn't mention Mary. But Paul begins by saying, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through that Christ, he has blessed us. Mary is part of that us. 
through Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual. And I made a capital less there. You don't have to translate it that way. The Father, Son, and Spirit. The work of the Father through the Son, now by the Spirit, is given to us with every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer. Can you imagine that? Like you're going to go waltzing up to heaven's door? What do you want? Everything. Everything that heaven can offer, please give it to me. How are you going to be received? Welcome. This is the heart of God. It is so unbelievably grandiose what Paul talks about here. Every spiritual blessing that heaven can offer, it's yours. This is what God wants. He wants to give it all to you. Oh, please, Paul, tell us what you're talking about. Well, already before the creation of the world, God chose us, the Creator chose us through Christ to be holy and perfect in His presence. How's that work out? Everybody else here that's holy and perfect, please raise your hand with me. <laughs> that's not my experience. Who here is holy and perfect? There was one named Christ who got that done, lived with that perfect love. Anybody here holy and perfect? Of course, they're going to laugh at me. Anybody here that's going to be holy and perfect? Isn't that the astounding promise that, that he's going to make us new when we raise up? When we stand before him in his presence, we're going to be holy and perfect. And here's what's really weird. We're going to find this across the scripture, that in his presence, even now as God looks at us, he sees holy and perfect. Think of, we can't see right, God? He says, oh no, I see perfectly right, because I see you through Christ. He puts on his Jesus glasses, and he looks at you and me, and he says, ah, perfect. I see you the way you're going to be done already now. I'm not making this up. It's already because of his love. He declared to adopt us through Jesus Christ, to bring us into the family of his son, our brother. God freely chose to do this so that his kindness, his grace, that he had given to us and his dear son would be, what's this all about? Praise. Praise the Father before creation chose to adopt you because of Christ. So in my own family, we know a little bit about adoption. My youngest daughter and my eldest daughter are both adopted out of the five. So it's fun, like we're just we call them the youngins now, the two little ones when we go traveling. People see us out and they always assume that Nathaniel and Rachel are boyfriend, girlfriend. <laughs> and we go, we go, oh no, that's our daughter. And they say, well, but, but she looks Chinese. And go, she is. Yeah, she's adopted. And then they go, oh, we get it. So where's Nathaniel from? He's Russian, right? <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't make any difference, honestly. I mean, these are my kids. You think I love one more than another? We're so different, aren't we? We've got different stories. You think God loves one more than another? Here's what's weird. You think God loves Jesus more than you? Oh, I don't naturally fit with God like Jesus does. You're adopted. You're in. <laughs> Did you become God's kid by creation or by adoption? Actually, the answer is yes. He did create you. And yet, when you ran away, he also delighted to adopt you. So beautiful. He did it through the blood of his son. Set us free from all that nasty past, from all that twist within us and all around us. God forgives because of the overflowing grace, this astounding kindness, keeps on coming and coming, gives us every kind of wisdom and insight. And that got it again, niggling at me. Every kind of wisdom and insight. Okay, I will admit, I understand everything. I've got perfect wisdom and insight. Everybody else, please raise your hand. <laughs> what are you talking about, Paul? You're just making big stories that can't possibly be true. Who has all wisdom and insight other than Jesus himself? 
Well, we don't yet. But actually, we know the only thing that is worth knowing. He gave us every kind of wisdom and insight when he revealed the mystery of his plan. Everything he was going to do through Christ. Everything he was going to do for us because of Christ. He planned it. He planned it. He planned it, Paul keeps saying. It came true in history, God's plan. Everything coming true in Christ. This great plan to make us his. So that our hope on Christ would be, I'm praised. <laughs> Thank you, God, for getting your plan done. For showing us in Jesus' own crucifixion and resurrection this amazing plan that we are set free to. This is the, uh, the word of slavery. <coughs> Liberation, Paul is talking about. In Ephesus, there were many people that were enslaved. Probably more than half the population, and it was the third or fourth biggest city in the Roman Empire. A lot of people have been sold and worked and were cared for, but really belonged to somebody else. And Paul says, you were set free. You used to belong to somebody else. Master sin. And if you know what Paul means by that, I challenge you still today. Let this be the day where you're going to declare that on my own strength, I'm now going to stand free from sin and I ain't going to go that way no more. How's that going to work for you? <laughs> you're going to be able to have no nasty thoughts, no mean words. But now Jesus is breaking the chains to set us free. When a slave goes free, he goes free from the old master and he goes a new way. Jesus is setting us free to where? Here's where it's going towards. The goal is Christ. That Christ is the head of everything in heaven and earth, especially the head of you and me. That he is like the head and we are his body. We're the way that he lives in the world. We're set free to Christ. Because our hope already now is focused on what he's going to do for us. God's plan reveals that we are free to a new master, the great liberator himself. We're not free to our own foolishness to get lost again, but we're free to rest in his astounding care. To live in his amazing strength. Free to Christ. Am I sure it's for me? <laughs> well, you heard it. Even now. It's not Gulpy's words. It's his promise. That Paul wrote. You believe that this message is true despite all the lies. You're sinning, you're despairing, you're dying, there's no hope. It's not true. We've got a hope focused on Christ. It's this amazing good news. There's forgiveness, there's new life, and it is personal. He has saved you individually. In him, you were sealed. Again, Paul is thinking words of Slavery. Back in the days of Moses, when someone was taken as a slave, and sometimes we're not thinking like slaves in the American South, sometimes people were so poor and so hopeless that they would sell themselves to some rich man, I will work for you, you care for me and my family. And Moses said, if somebody really wants to do that, that's permissible but you must mark them so that they know, everybody knows they belong to somebody else. And Moses said, put a hole in their eardrum, not in their eardrum, in their ear lobe, with an ear. You can look at somebody and see that they were a slave. That's probably not what we mean when we wear an earring today, right? In Rome's day, it was different. But someone still had to be marked, had to be sealed, to be publicly seen as a slave. What was the mark in ancient Rome for a slave? Some sort of tattoo. Like a really nasty in the American South when they would like cattle use a brand 
to mark a slave, right? Paul is saying you now belong not to the enemy. You now belong not even to yourself. You belong to this new glorious master who's going to give you good work, a fruitful life, and always care for you. And you were sealed by the Spirit. So when did that happen for you? <laughs> you remember in your own individual story? When did the Holy Spirit come to you personally and say, boom, you're now marked, you're his? <laughs> this Holy Spirit guaranteeing that you've got the inheritance forever. Jesus died to give it to you, it belongs to you now. With the risen one, you've got the guarantee you belong to him. God's going to receive you guys the praise and glory for this. God sealed you. Your future, as sure as today, is secure. I didn't answer the question, though. How are you sealed? Mary had an astounding experience. The tradition around her, not in the scripture, is that she was busy drawing water for her family. If you go to Bethlehem today, if you go to Nazareth today, they show you the well where Mary was allegedly getting water, just doing her daily chores when she was surprised. This angel Gabriel, in a word, and Mary said, how can this be? I don't even know a man. And Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And this little child is going to start. God himself, Mary. <laughs> Mary remembers that day the rest of her life, don't you think? Wow. That makes me jealous. You got a word from God that said you're going to be the mother of the Messiah, the mother of God? I need not that, Mary. And when she meets him, Mary's going to smack you up the side of the head if they ask him that. She'll say, you got me being easy. Because <laughs> you got Jesus not nine months in your womb like I did. You got him also like I did your whole life in your heart. You were sealed. Not with some brand or some tattoo or some earring. You were sealed really easy and gentle. Nobody else could see what the Spirit said to me and how he affected me until it became obvious. But I knew. Maybe people don't always see how God sealed you because it's very subtle. It's very gentle. You might almost call it a water mark. April 13, 1958, I was sealed. God made a promise to me. I was two weeks old. Praise to God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Through Christ, God has blessed us. Blessings just coming down. I think the reason I didn't like these kinds of images is it just seemed like it was too much Mary up there with the Trinity. And now I hear God saying to me, what are you, stupid? If you don't like Mary being there, let's make this really difficult. Take Mary's picture out of there and put yours in there. That's what I'm talking about, says God. I made you. I redeemed you with Jesus' blood. I'm making you my own by the gift of the Spirit. This is all about you. Because I desire that you belong to me. You can pray now and forever. Every spiritual blessing, the best one is God himself. And that's exactly what he's given to us. Himself. Praise God. Always has, now does, forever will bless us. Praise to you, Father, before creation, you chose us. You are not the because of Christ. Praise to you, O oh Son, in history you shed your blood. You revealed God's plan to free us to yourself. Praise to you, Spirit, in our histories, you sealed us. You baptized each one to guarantee 
side of the family, and then we're going to come back. The memorial here is August 3 for that. And there's also a date for August 1 for a Debbie Ainsley's memorial. Are there other uh, needs or thanks that you want to add? Prayers for those grieving, prayers for our nation, prayers for the sick, prayers thanking God for James. We're going to turn to page 191. We're going to stand, and we're going to speak first our faith, the faith given to us in our baptism, the creed. And then continue with worship there from page 191. Okay, page. Yep, the Nicene Creed on page 191. Let's speak together our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in one peace, his Lord, and his Son, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God and his Father before all worlds, God of God. Praise to you, Father, Son, and Spirit. You, the Blessed One, who have so blessed us with every spiritual gift that heaven can offer, with the gift of your own presence, your love, your life in our lives. Help our faith. Give us faith. Give us love. <coughs> oh God, three in one, to cling to you, to rejoice in you, to overflow with your blessings, that we may be the blessing you intend to those around us. Lord, in your mercy, we do pray, Lord, for all who govern and serve and care for our community, our state, our nation. After our patriotic celebration last week, Lord, we have to come back again. Every week we need your governance and your care for this world. Restrain the evildoer. Protect those 
who would do good for our nation. Enable each of us as fellow citizens to care for one another, to reach out with your love that encompasses all the world. Work your wonders, Lord, as you alone can. Lord, in your mercy, you know us each, having adopted us in the waters of baptism, bringing us into that great global family, drawing us towards the glory to come. But you know, even right now in this history, as sure as Jesus suffered, so we, your people, made in his image, very crosses, bear crosses that are not always visible to others. Where needs are lifted up, Lord, we join in that prayer. Your healing for Kimmy, Steve, Janet, Carolyn, Rich, Anne, Sandy, Joe. These and the many in our hearts. Your comfort for those who are grieving, including the family of Kathy. Jim and those with him grieving for Debbie. All with Leanne grieving for her father, Richard. So many griefs in this, Lord. And you are the God of joy, the giver of life. We praise you for new life poured out on our friend James this day. Ask you to keep him and keep each of us, Lord, in our baptism covenant, reminded that we are sealed by you, that your promise is never taken back. But all that you have promised, you will make come true. Lord, in your mercy. These and all the prayers in our hearts, we lift to your throne on high. Lord God, Heavenly Father, who with the Son by whom you redeemed us, with the Spirit whom you poured out, you are our one true God, living and ruling over all this day and forever. Amen. Let's turn then to page 194. The Lord's service is happening. Page 194. The Lord be with you.
our Lord Jesus Christ on that Passover night. When he himself to death was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had thanked his heavenly Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, this given for you. Do this as often as you eat us in remembrance of me. In the very same way, Jesus took the cup after the supper and again, when he had given thanks, he gave after the same. Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you. The forgiveness of your sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
from page 199. You're going to sing with Simeon that Jesus has come to us. Page 199. Unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. 